I think the, a good place to begin, trying to make neighborhood hearts where the action is. If people get fond of their district, their neighborhood, and stay there, and if the city is working the way it should, they begin to get connections, they begin to, in the next generation, to get better educations and so on. And all of this is reflected in the neighborhood, taking the neighborhoods that exist already, and maybe they're not very attractive, and maybe they've only got poor people in, and maybe they've only got immigrants in, but thinking, what can you do here to keep these people here and to make them feel that they're valued? So you have to pay attention to what the people in the neighborhood want. One thing they want is they don't want to live in an undignified place. Well, what defines a great city? That was the late Jane Jacobs, author and activist. She's known for her dense, busy, diverse vision of cities with heart, often contrasted with her oftentimes nemesis, Robert Moses, better known for highways, bridges, and large-scale infrastructural development. As so many cities are grappling with change right now, what's the legacy of these two figures and what defines smart city policy for the future? We welcome Roberta Brandis Gratz. She's author most recently of The Battle for Gotham, New York in the Shadow of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. She's also co-founder of the Center for the Living City. Also with us, John Mollenkopf, author and, cent and director of the Center for Urban Research at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Well, let's start. Roberta, you knew Jane when she talks about neighborhoods with heart. Um, is that what defines a great city in your view, and what does she mean by that? Well, it's certainly one of the things, but I think her main point, which is so well shown in this clip, is that uh, urbanism is a process, and city building is a process, and we build and we change. We add to and we strengthen existing places with the people in place having a real say in what happens. And that's what builds strong neighborhoods, whereas Moses sought to totally replace them, erase them with new, newly developed uh, projects, not necessarily places. And they, the roots and the authenticity of people coming together in a natural way doesn't evolve in a, a Moses kind of project. How do you look at what makes good and bad city policy, John? Well, I think Roberta has hit a lot uh, right on the head in terms of vibrant neighborhoods that people feel are taken into consideration by higher level policymakers is, is certainly a key. But we also need to think about what makes city economies vibrant. And that's another topic that Jane Jacobs contributed to over the years. Uh, for a long time, it was thought that cities were basket cases going to be abandoned. I think New York and other 24-hour CBDs like Boston and San Francisco are, are also counterexamples to that. City business development. Right. City bu central business districts. Central the downtowns. business districts. All right. Got it. Downtowns have survived Robert Moses, thankfully. Well, Robert Moses, though, would argue and did argue that his vision, too, was to make a better city and a city that was more economically viable. And he said sometimes you need massive Demolition. Here he is actually making a case um, that it may not be pleasant, but sometimes it's called for. Take a look. Hey, but you have to move a lot of people out of the way of a big housing uh, project or uh, some clearance project like, uh, say, Lincoln Square, whatever the objective may be, uh, or out of the way of uh, an approach to a bridge uh, that uh, they're not, a lot of them are not going to like it. Many of them are misinformed. Uh, many of them in the end come around to feel that they've done them a great service. And, uh, <clears throat> but in the process, if there is somebody to excite them, to steam them up, there's somebody that uh, is a ringleader, you get a terrific amount of criticism. And uh, paper, newspapers join in it, churches join in it, and there it is. And that frightens the elected offices. Are you theoretically, and according to some of the uh, goo-goos and uplift organizations, we ought to negotiate with every individual until he's happy. Do you imagine when you build anything under those conditions? 
can't imagine why he would say he when so clearly that rabble rouser he's referring to is probably Jane Jacobs. Um, but what about his argument there? I mean, you hear it today. It may not be pretty, but people can't go back to the lower ninth ward in New Orleans. Detroit lost half its population. We just got to destroy some blocks to build something new. Well, what, the, what fortunately has been shown since the 1970s, and this is very much what my book is about, is that Moses was wrong. The city regrew in, it, in the neighborhoods he didn't destroy. And in fact, today, the most vibrant neighborhoods in New York and in many cities are the ones that urban renewal did not touch and had an opportunity to uh, regrow themselves in the urban process that Jane articulated so well, and about economics as well. Her favorite book of, of hers that was The Economy of Cities, which was 1969, in which she showed how city economies regrow from the bottom up, starting small, and what is being lost in today's um, mania for shrinking cities is that it's not just about where people live, is how do you regrow a, an economy? We're through okay with the big industries, supposedly. But there are small things happening, and that's how the big things originally start. Now, if we talk to the people, for example, the case of Detroit, we, we were just there for the social forum. Detroit has lost half its population. And while many buildings have been destroyed, a lot are just sitting there empty. Not a whole lot springing up, some stuff, but what's your take, John, for those who say, look, we just got to shrink because there's nobody left here? Well, I think it's a matter of fact that, that Detroit has shrunk tremendously. I think the kinds of policies advocated by Robert Moses hastened that process and that if Talk they had never how. happened to, well, building radio freeway systems and tearing down neighborhoods in the heart of the city, uh, both cause people to want to leave the city for the suburbs. So, and, and that's at least part of what happened to Detroit. It's a very complicated case. Um, I'd be curious to what Roberta has to say about how to regenerate inner city areas like Detroit. Yeah. It's, it's a tough challenge. example, I keep, saying, I keep saying two things. First of all, I have not found, I, I am a journalist. I go and I look and I observe as Jane instructed us all to do. I have not found a city yet that has been revitalized by shrinking. I have only found places that have been revitalized by figuring out, out ways to repopulate, to bring back the population, and not to think it was hopeless. In the 1970s, the South Bronx looked like Dresden after the war. Today, you can barely find an empty piece of land to build on. And that started grassroots, bottom up, small, block by block. Sure, bring in new business. Don't pasteurize Detroit. Don't turn it into an agricultural site. Turn it into a birthplace for new businesses and, and generate new things uh, because cities need density. All right, so what will it take? I mean, I recently drove through a little uh, town in upstate New York called Monticello, which has had a devastated downtown for as long as I can remember, 20 years minimum. Clearly, some stimulus money has helped them build new pavements, new sidewalks, a, a nice concrete median down the middle of the road. The road looks great, but there is barely a functioning store on that Main Street road. Look, you know, we've bailed out the big boys. We have done nothing for the small businesses. Ford, General Motors, U.S. Steel, uh, Macy's, you name the big corporations. They started either in push carts or backyards or in garages. So what should they We're have done in Monticello? We're not funding those the people sidewalks? today. No, I bet there are businesses in Monticello that could be uh, stimulated to come downtown. I've written about this. I've seen this in many small communities. Uh, there are ways to give cheap space, free space, dollar space to uh, small entrepreneurs to get started. 85% of the new jobs in this country come from small businesses, businesses under 100 people. We're not doing anything for them. And I know this personally because I own one. And that's where we need to be stimulating an economy. And in Detroit, let them do what Baltimore did in the 60s and 70s and has worked elsewhere. And what I wrote about recently in Detroit, sell the houses for a dollar. Mm. There are people out there looking for a place to, to, to live they can't afford, a place to you bring their work at the same time, 
give them the opportunity, live, work, do it themselves, sweat equity. It worked in the 70s. It could work again. Do you have again. a favorite example, John? Well, I think this is a little bit off topic, but immigration and immigrant enterprises also Absolutely. had a tremendously positive influence on a lot of places. And we should stop being so anti-immigrant in the country and think about uh, helping streams of immigrants to come pl to places like Detroit that need their help. Absolutely. And John's written about that. And in fact, I say in the book, we don't really give credit to the fact that the immigration in this in New York City as well in other cities you can go to Utica New York you can go to cities out west the immigration population has really revived whole neighborhoods brought new businesses started small and now some of them are nationwide and so we've, big. Only, we've only got about 30 seconds but if you were recommending to a city right now that's panicked one thing they could do you tell a wonderful story in the living city about a carousel that made all the difference one suggestion as people feel so nervous in this election period well i would say start with you know giving giving the property away for a dollar and inviting small businesses to occupy vacant spaces give the entrepreneur an opportunity to start with a single person to two person they add that's where the growth of jobs will all come right, from all right roberta grass thank you so much and john mollenkopf there's more information at our website grittv.org and a link to Roberta's new book from Nation Books.